tonight is Matthias. Um, he's been a uh, consultant with Google working on the Angular JS project for uh, what, two years now, and um, recently got an offer from Google to work full time with them at their um, very ugly, annoying office down in California that no one wants to go to. Uh, Matthias, I, mean, um, I hear it's so cold there. It's cold, it's yeah. Yeah, no wants to go there. Um, so anyway, I, I grabbed him and pulled him by the leg and asked him to kindly speak about Angular 2.0 and uh, give a Q&A session, um, and he, he agreed. So um, anyway, without further ado, he has discussed. All right, so we're going to talk about 2.0. Uh, this koala right here is really excited about it. Like, he's like so excited that like, he's going to be able to do this koala 2.0. He's actually like a new tune to He's making his cartoons based off that. Okay, so we have, uh, like, uh, for, those who don't, for those of whom don't know me, I got started with Angular by blogging and here on Google my website that led me to it. And you know, it was through blogging that I got to work with them and eventually got to Google. Here's a sort of breakdown of who I am. And uh, I was born in Finland and I lived here in Canada for over 15 years. And that cloud was my blog's logo and Angular is just a little bit for Angular. Okay, so. For those of who are using Angular, your head down. Like, so these people, don't put your head on me. You know, it's your first. Did I say for those of you who are or aren't? I don't know. I said R. Okay, so <laughs> let's revise. Who has never used it at all? And this is like completely new. Okay, good. And this is, kind of, this is good because it's, you know, usually I present at the Angular meetups stuff, and there's a lot of domain knowledge people understand about Angular, but this is 2.0, it's a completely different version of Angular, and for those who haven't seen it, you'll kind of begin to appreciate what it's all about. So I already asked these questions, think about websites and web apps. You can, probably, you can look at any website and you can say, oh, I can write that web app using just like regular jQuery. That's true, you can, but it gets on ahead pretty quick. You end up having tons of callbacks and it gets messy and stuff like that. So the idea with Angular and these NPC things is that these frameworks reduce the amount of work, right? Common sense. You look at someone, look at a website built Rails, or you build it with raw PHP, there's obviously a completely huge difference in how difficult there is. So these NPC websites, Angular, Ember, Apple, and they reduce the code for you. So 2.0 and 1.0, oh, 1.x has been around for maybe almost five years. And 2.0 is a completely different, completely new level of an Angular app. Right now it's in its alpha mode. You know, so it's not like you're gonna take what you learn here and start building big websites. No, it's an alpha, right? And there's no documentation yet, but it's you know, there's close to 20 people working on this thing right now all the time. There's a lot of people putting their heads in. There's a lot of smart people building this framework. So one of the key selling factors that's gonna be close to 10 times faster pointers. Maybe 10 might be a little bit of a, a sort of, you know, unclear thing right now. Who knows what will be in the end, but it's definitely going to be much faster than what we're expecting. There's a lot of optimizations internally to make that happen. The link at the bottom, and I'll show this the link to the slides at the end for anyone who didn't get that. This is a link to a repo that gives you the, the latest version of Angular 2 that you can use to build up. It's really well put together, it's really nice. So the demo project that together, here's the demo project, and for the Angular conference last year, I built a YouTube browser, and that's kind of my go-to app to build. Many people just make a to-do app, I like YouTube's API, it's very nice. So this is a YouTube browser that is built for 2.0, it works, it's nice. All right, so, you know, how does 2.0 work? The biggest thing is it uses VS6, it's not, like the actual framework itself uses ES6, you're not forced to use the ES6 code, but ES6 for now, you have ES6 to make it work, and we use this tool called Tracer, which takes the high level ECMAScript 6 code and converts it down into today's JavaScript code that browsers understand. And we task mentioned 6 to 5, but that got we changed, I would have known that earlier, we put that there, and we all know about web packages now. So, why do we care about ES6? So imagine 
imagine talking to your friends and they're just like, dude, I don't understand what you're saying. You boost that a different way and then you change it around, you change it. And by the end of it, the context is kind of lost in what you're trying to say because you know, you've broken it down to such a different level that you know, the, the, the emphasis of what you're saying isn't there. So the way that I look at this is that ES6 is just a completely different level of JavaScript code where you can ex better express what you're saying and still have same code where you don't have to have your own complex data structures, you don't have to have like, you know, hack together classes, you don't have to have a custom promise library. You can use all kinds of cool things like filtering and mapping and reducing in your JavaScript code. It's just this whole level of features in the language. So if there's anyone who, you know, started out as a Java developer and then you go to JavaScript, you probably notice there's a huge change in the expressiveness of the language. I took some time and I wrote Dart apps for a bit and I noticed that, wow, Dart's really nice in terms of the language and ES6 is, the ES6 compared to ES5 is kind of day, and then there's an ES7 on the horizon as well. So, let's take a look at the index file for our Angular app. If I go down here, we have our index page, and this index page isn't anything like, you know, a regular website. The idea here is this index page kind of ties everything together, and if you look on line 12, we have system, and system is, you know, tracer's runtime, and the runtime takes that high-level code and compiles it down to something that works on the browser today. So this thing we're saying that we're going to load Angular 2, we have this other library called RTPS Assert, and I'm entirely sure it's for runtime assertions. I, I did sort of build this app based off another app, so that might not be needed right here. We have the YouTube application, which I've written, and then we have some additional libraries that you know, are going to power this website. There's nothing really in this index file that makes you know, that we have to remember. The only thing we have to note is that on line eight, we have the application. So it is a custom HTML tag, a web component that loads the entire app. It loads our Angular app based on work. So Angular 2.0 is heavily web component based. And you know, why do we care about that? Well, the idea of a web component is that it's kind of like iframes, but you know, not crazy like iframes. Or it's a website inside of a website. It's more or less that everything involving that component is self-contained inside of that web component. And right now, not all browsers support this, and not all we support it as well. Chrome has it, and Firefox has it as well. But the idea here is that if we have styling, the so styling is going, to, uh, is going to be relevant to only the web component and its whole ecosystem. And the cool thing is that everything's really portable. You make a web component, I make a web component. I can theoretically take your web component, throw it into my website, and it will behave as it should. And the way that it does this is it has this ecosystem called a shadow node, where you end up having this hidden layer of components that make the plugin behave as it should. So you can have the outer layer, which is the customization, and then the plumbing code, the shadow node, interact together and make a uh, component. So if you think about the video tag in HTML5, if you, if you leave it as it is, you get the controls of the video player, right? So those buttons that show up in there, that's a part of the shadow node. It's not like you said, oh, we're going to have button, button one, button two, button three. No, they're created on, like sort of in a background layer with the component. That's how the shadow node works. So the YouTube app, let's take a look at how it's built. There's really only four files, and you know the, the CSS files are really any, anything important. So there's really only three files that we care about. The JS file is going to have the application, the HTML file is going to have the UI, and the JS file is another library file that we're going to use to query the YouTube servers. So let's take a look at the JavaScript code for, for the YouTube app. So I have an app directory here, I go to YouTube. Here we have some really advanced PS6 code. What we're doing here is we're importing specific features from Angular 2.0's library. So we're saying we want to have the ability to have components in our code, templates, and we have this function called bootstrap and for each, right? These are all various functions that we're going to use in our application. So right here we have something called an annotation. And what an annotation does is it provides metadata to existing objects, existing classes in your code. It provides context. So it's not like you have to have annotations in your code. You could probably have some special, you know, set this value on this class. But it's, it's code that explains code. 
And in this case, we're saying that this is this particular code, this u2.code, which we're going to go through down here, this is a component that lives in our Angular app. And in here, we're going to load in the library to download stuff from YouTube, and we're going to set the selector as a tag called YouTube app. So if you notice the index file, it has a tag, YouTube app. And that's where the application lives. And then also with this class, we're assigning our HTML file, which is going to show the UI for the application. And then what's cool here is that we're saying that the directives that we're going to have is an if statement directive and a for each statement to loop things and to show and hide particular components in our HTML code. If I go further down here, what's really nice about this is that this is just a simple class. There's nothing in the UI happening here. All that we're doing is we're setting properties onto the class. So for example, we have the yt value, so on line 19, in our constructor, we're asking for other services. This is known as dependency injection. Here I'm saying that we want to have a YouTube API class, like an instance of that class, and we're going to assign it to our members. And then we're going to search, as soon as the page loads, we're going to search for JavaScript. What the search is doing is it's calling the library. And if you look at line 26, you can see that it says dot net. This is a, a promise in JavaScript. So it's saying, once the search is complete, then set the results. If we go further down here, we can see that for set results, all it's doing is it's setting data onto the class. There's no custom abstraction. There's no you know, setters and getters that have to be defined by the library. This is a VS6 class and it works well. And then we have a few other things like preview video and hide video, which we'll take a look at in a moment. So at the very bottom, all that I'm saying here is this is the main function when the application starts. And we're going to take this YouTube app that we built and bootstrap it into Angular. All right, that's cool. But the real cool stuff is going to be the HTML, which I'm going to go over in a moment. Back to the slides, we talked about you know, these various properties and what they mean in an Angular app. And then now we can talk about the HTML stuff. So the idea of Angular, which is its big selling point, is that it improves, you know, it makes HTML more powerful than, it's, than it is by itself. The idea is that if, if you have to set event listeners, if you have to, you know, have change, you know, a, a listener to see if a particular input field changed, that's all excess code. It's kind of code that you'll throw away at the end of the day. But with 2.0, well, with 1.x, and you know, 2.x, it brings it to a whole new level where you have these two particular properties here, we can have bindings, and then you can have events. So if we take a look at our code, here we have, well first of all, let's take a look at the app. This is a YouTube video search here. It's nothing spectacular. The idea here is that I can search for, you know, Toronto JavaScript. And you know, we have some you know, cool videos from Toronto JavaScript. <laughs> we all know who this guy is. Okay, so it's loading that video, and <laughs> okay, so it loaded that video, and it updated the results really quickly, and did all that stuff for us. But if you know, notice here, we really, really have two things that are happening: we're searching and listing results, and then we click on something, and that video is previewing at the top of the page. So how do we sort of tie all this stuff together? Because there's a great deal of user interactivity that makes the third thing work. So the header part, which has a search header, what we're doing is we have this pound symbol. And this pound symbol, this pound symbol ties this input field to a local variable called searcher. And that means that we can have searcher use its HTML, you know, the DOM property for value, and we're going to say search. So the search function, we're saying when an input event happens, so that's what these parentheses mean, we are going to run the search function on the class that we define, and we're going to pass in search for value. So we've effectively turned H2O into a quasi-programming language. So now if we go further down, the part that actually lists out the video, videos, here we're just saying for each of the results, because remember the part that said set results, we're setting results on the class. For each of the results, list them. So the 4H is going to list all the results. And if you look on line 36, what we're doing here is we're setting some bindings. We're setting source. The source of the, of the image is going to be the particular result in the loop. So if you look on line 35, we're, we're aliasing results in results. 
and we're saying the source is going to be this poster URL. And then when you click on it, which is the event, which parentheses, you're going to run the preview function, which is going to preview this video. So if I go further up here, as soon as that video has been previewed, so as soon as we have a preview video assigned to the memory of the page, we're going to show this block of color here. So here we set that we show the title, and then we have it so that when you click on the video, it hides the video, and then we have it here when you click on this thing, it's just a regular link which is going to point to the YouTube page of that. So everything where you see square brackets, that's when we're setting up the binding of the page, and where you see parentheses is when an event happens. So unlike Angular 1x, where you have custom directives which you know describe and click events, all of this is tied directly into the DOM. So click events and then enter event and input event. So this saves a ton of code and it gives you the, you the author full control of the interactivity of your HTML. It's really fascinating. So we saw the bindings, we saw the event bindings. But here we also see the structural agents, which are like for each event. And then we see the local variables, which is the pound sign where we take the, where we tie the uh, DOM element into the memory of the application that we can access the DOM and its properties. So all that plumbing that we saw in the HTML code makes all the interactivity communicate with the application code. So what about the external data? What about stuff like the YouTube API? How does that work? So the main thing is that ES6, might be ES7, I think it is ES6, has support for DOM promises, native promises. And most browsers are already support them out of the box. So what we do is we have a promise that returns some asynchronous data. So we're going to query a YouTube server, and we're going to get some data back eventually. So that's what we have our API library. So if I go to my app, and I go to lib, and I go to YouTube API, here I have a class that's designed to search YouTube server. And you know anything that you see in like all upper caps, it's not necessarily a constant, it's just a convention that I do for data that won't change. So here, for example, we have that search function that we call. And right now, Angular 2 doesn't have its own wrapper complete for Ajax requests. We're just using the regular browser to find XML HTTP request. So in here, we're saying that you know, we're going to query this the URL. So that's a search URL plus the query string. And on line 16, we're returning a promise. And then we get these two functions that are promise for resolving when the promise is succeeded, and rejecting when the promise fails. So an example of a rejected promise would be YouTube server is down. We're going to reject it. So in this case, we're resolving the promise, but we're resolving it when the HTTP request is done. So if you look on line 18, that line is taking the results that come from the request, and we're preparing them, you know, adding the title, adding the ID, setting up the image URL, and then we're calling the resolved data. So then back here, we have the uh, we have the function call that's called when the promise is resolved. And then here we you know assign the data that was provided from the YouTube search results into the page. What's really cool about 2.0 is that Angular knows all of the asynchronous requests, so something to a server, a timeout, a request animation frame, and then it knows that when the request is done, it will update the page for you. So there's no code in here which I'm saying, you know, re-render the page. As soon as data comes in, it is put onto the scope, it will update instantly. This is a practice known as zoning, and Angular Dart has this, and 1.x doesn't have this, but 2.0 does, and it's really cool. So that zoning capability allowed us to update the page automatically, and the data promises make it so that we don't have to have this pyramid of callbacks in either side of our code. Okay, so you know, if we take a look, a few more examples of the app, we have that clicking behavior, we can hide stuff, we can search for other things. So if I search for you know, Rob or oh, my connection oh, it's coming. You know, you see all these wonderful videos of our mayor, our ex mayor. So that was the that was the mechanism of the for each, and this was the mechanism of the listing. But the HTML code is very concise and easy to understand. Okay, so there are a lot of differences in 1.x. The main difference is that it's fully engulfed into ES6. You know, and 
the web component system makes everything easier to you know, encapsulate and manage. And the HTML code is a lot more sophisticated, so you know, having repeaters and if statements and everything is all defined in the HTML. Our JavaScript code doesn't have to have you know, really much at all to do with the view. It's just setting data that is consumed by the view. And then, as future versions of Angular come out, 1.4 is coming out very soon, the gap between 1.4 and 2.0, because both of these frameworks are being developed at the same time, is going to get smaller. So as future versions of 1.x come out, they're going to be closer and closer to 2.0. It won't be the same thing eventually, but it'll make you as the developer who invest into 1.x and make the job easier for you to migrate to 2.0. And the main thing with 2.0 is that it's going to use evergreen browsers, which are browsers that update themselves automatically when new versions come out. So if you think about an evergreen tree, it just grows and grows and grows. And I think that the latest version of uh, IE is evergreen. And then another thing is that there's all these other features in Angular, such as NG Animates and the Router. They're, doing, they're being developed right now to support both 1.x and 2.x to the same point. Building this app, it was uh, kind of challenging because you know, first of all, there's no documentation because it's an alpha. And the debugging it was fairly easy at some points. Other points, you know, I had to sort of figure out what line was causing the issue, and it was going into the tracer compiled code. It was kind of hard to figure out. And then I've never really coded with web components before, but with web components, it was actually very hard to you know get CSS to kind of work outside of the web component and work inside of the web component. I think at one point I tried to make that search bar fixed at the top of the page, but the relative positioning inside of the web component wasn't really hard, like doing well with the relative positioning of the body tag. I don't really know much about what components to start to go against that, but I've never had an app not function because the CSS was causing issues. This isn't a problem with Angular, it's just that you know, web components are a brand new thing, and it'll take us some time to get used to them. So just to find a few little things to sort of Provide you, in case you have thoughts, Angular 2 is very fast. It's, you know, the code execution is great. There's actually been some times where I, you know, didn't use a variable, or I used a variable that, that wasn't defined, and it would actually tell me in the console that this is happening. And that was the ES6, you know, tra like tracer part, figuring out what's going on. So, despite the debugging being tricky, it is actually very helpful in times when it works. But as this framework grows, it's going to get easier and easier over time to use. And once again, ES7, which is a new set of features that are coming to, are coming to JavaScript, will also be making an impression over the coming year, uh, months and years. Here are two videos I would advise to take a look at. One is from last week's NG Conf talk, talking about 2.0. And this one is about ES6 and ES7, all the fancy new features that are coming to, them, to JavaScript. And there's some really cool stuff in there that they talk about, you know, generators and uh, async functions and streams, and how you can use that in your JavaScript. Beautiful. Here are the links to the slides, the demo app, and uh, feel free to work that and add more stuff to it. But otherwise, that's all for the talk. Thank you. Any questions at all? Yes. I really like web components. I think it's very good. I've been writing some, uh, also some Polymer apps. But uh, one thing I have not been able to find that seems like such a, a central thing to have in, in other languages I did is like the idea of an interface, or how does this component inform the application about what properties it has for you to use, for you to bind to, you know what I mean? It's like you kind of need to know them as the programmer. Uh, is there, I, I'm not sure if I'm missing it or, or if you come across something or if there's something in Angular 2.0 for that. So if we think, so I'll, I'll sort of revise the question in the context of this. What component is, uh, so the question was, you know, if we have a what component, how do we know what properties are consumed by the what component, what properties aren't? And if we don't know, do we have some form of validation that will tell us? And I can't answer that question because I've not fully, you know, I don't fully, full out know what components yet. 
But the idea of web components is that you have the HTML tag and you have properties, and those properties go into the web component, which help it build its, helps itself, you know, construct itself. Um, I would say for now, it's up to you as a developer to sort of outline, hey, you forgot this property, or hey, this one is included. There's no direct interface for it. It's not like a Java interface where you have to implement these methods, and you have to have these properties. The chances are that the component is, you know, crafted together smart, like in a smart way where if you don't include the property, it's going to yell at you. And if you do, it's just adding extra functionality to it. Okay. Next question. Yes? I was just going to add, I think you define the prototype, right? I mean, Tennessee, you actually create the prototype for that component, if I recall correctly. <laughs> so, once again, about components, you know, I, I haven't really played around too much with the internals of 2.0, and this is a big abstraction on top of it. Yeah, so that, that's what I noticed too. Like, if you go back, you have like completely invalid HTML, which I assume obviously gets auto generated. Which is kind of interesting because you have to kind of mix a web component stuff with all the. Yeah, so Angular's approach to making components is not one to one with web components in general. They add their own flavor on top of it. And if you were to sort of make your own web components, you'd do something in Polymer, which is a polyfill, which makes it work on working on the browsers. But at the end of the day, the mechanism of having components all falls down to web components, which browsers will support fully at one day. Next question. Yes. That's it. So, I mean, you mentioned um, Crest Tracer as a, as a thing to use, right? But we've heard at Engicon that the uh, Angular team is moving to uh, TypeScript and that content on the TypeScript is going to be the, you know, so that you have to use it, but that's kind of the recommended method for building. Now, so the question is that, does, what do you, I mean, does that mean that so Tracer is, moving from Tracer to TypeScript, and then do you know what that means practically for uh, all those like, ES6 components, like features that TypeScript doesn't have, and based on my conversations with them, they don't seem to have a lot of plans of implementing these activity groups. Yeah, so the question was that, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a plan to use TypeScript to sort of drive this new feature set of JavaScript and Angular to and I think that the main reason was because TypeScript has been around for a long time in the past. And, you know, people use TypeScript, and you know, the typing system works really well. And at the end of the day, the Angular team wants to have these new language features to build a really cool framework. Right now, TypeScript is having a push. You know, Microsoft's working on making TypeScript more advanced to have you know, features of annotation, uh, the ES6 and ES7 features. Right now, it's uh, <coughs> they are getting improved. Like I think 1.4 TypeScript is going to have more of these features. However, for the development of the framework, they're using Tracer still because they need these features. Now. This will make more sense in the coming months, which you know, once TypeScript is more mature and it has these features. But um, at first, Google wanted to have their own sort of language or its own level of JavaScript called AppScript, but that was taken out of TypeScript. So if you want to sort of get an idea of you know how to use this stuff, take a look at TypeScript and get familiar with that language. Okay. Yes? Um, so, I am not going to use Angular, but um, I know, I, like, obviously with 2.0 coming out, some people kind of freaking out, like, oh my god, this is different stuff. But uh, for someone like yourself who you know, has done this kind of stuff and is aware of like, what 2.0 is like, for someone who's just trying to build regular Angular apps and they're trying to do like, you know, isn't even thinking about 2.0 right now. Is it just kind of like, if I now am building 1.x stuff and then a few years down the road, it's in a place where it'll make sense for me working on 2.0 stuff that it should be, it shouldn't be a huge like thing for my head space to like jump into that. Like should it be, be pretty smooth or is it, I don't know, I don't know how to phrase it exactly, but. So the question is, if you invest your time into Angular 1x, will the transition over to 2.x framework at some point you know, be a big jump? And as I mentioned before, the 1.x line, there's new versions coming up. There's a 1.5 version coming up sometime in the summer or the fall, and then a 1.6 and so on. 
as it gets closer to 2.0, the gap is going to get smaller. The transition jump is going to get smaller. And you know, it's not guaranteed that it's going to be like, oh, cool, 1.9 turns into 2.0, my code works the same. Uh, but the idea would be that that transition would be even smaller. If you have to determine now, you know, should I wait for 2.0 or should I start building apps with this? The Angular 1x line is supporting browsers that are available now, IE9 and above, basically. The 2.0 one will have a much stricter requirement for browsers, and you know, you might not be able to support the browsers right now that you need to support right now. So the thing is, if you have to determine if you have to build an app now, use the 1.x line, and you know, you'll at least have a migration path to 2.0 eventually. And you'll get all the cool features that are coming into the 1.x branch. There's a lot of cool stuff coming. So you know, 2.0 is not prime time right now. It's still an alpha mode. It's not going to be ready for a while. Who knows what time this year will be ready. But you know, both frameworks are definitely cutting edge. Last question, yes? I'm wondering what was it that you guys did to even the transition from one that made it so much faster. The speed improvement? Sorry? The speed performance? Yeah, the speed. So if we look at the Angular code, so if we go back here, the fact that you know, we have our own sort of language for describing parts of the HTML, like the star if, and down here we have the star repeat, this gives a little bit a better context for you know, the compiler and the code that optimizes it. The big difference is that the HTML code, the UI level, it's completely different from the actual programming part. So you have all these optimizations that can take place. The major difference that makes it faster is the way that it handles views. It has a lot more strict rules like you know, how views are done. And when you have better context, like the HTML code is described better, the JavaScript code has more room to optimize. Before, Angular just had directives everywhere, and the directives did stuff, and there wasn't really much room to improve. I don't know enough of the internal details, but I know that the digest system is not the same as it was before. And the way that the digest system worked in one X was that a change happens and it filters through all the data that's changed and it updates all the components in the page. Now it's a lot more, you know, if something does change, it knows exactly where it changed in the page and exactly where it changed in the, in the sort of data, like the data storage. Um, you have to take a look at Mishko's talk to have a better idea of how the performance is. It definitely has to do with the way that the HTML code structures itself. Is it possible for you to show, like, from the app that you put the YouTube app, just like to show, like, the DOM, what it looks like? Yeah. Um, so we'll go back to Rob Ford. Um, and if we take a look here, first of all, you see how it says shadow root. That's the web component of the system. Yeah. Take a look at the YouTube app. We have our containing tag. We're containing tag, and then um, as we start going to the shadow root, we have the actual parts of the page. So in here, for example, it's using the template tags to sort of outline the dynamic parts of the page. And you know, it looks it's it's not really much different from what it was before. Like we still have the clicking behaviors and stuff like that. It doesn't really morph the HTML much. All that HTML code is valid HTML that a browser will read. Sort of sort of valid, yes. If you if you run it through the you know, WPC validator, it'll start to complain. And Angular does have a different flavor, which is you know, acceptable from those validators. It's kind of like when Angular is in 1.x, where you have the data attributes, and we have the attributes of not data. The whole benefit of this is that you have it's you know it's like what XML is described to be, where it's human readable and machine readable. I know that if I see parentheses, that's an event. I know if I see brackets, that's Binding. So it saves you the cognitive you know, hurdles that you have to do to understand a different approach. What I say. But at the end of the day, I don't know if this code's going to be the same, like the final product. I don't know if they're going to add and you know, tweak HTML elements, but by now it looks pretty good. It's debuggable and understandable. Sir, I know you said the last question, but I've got to ask you something. Um, <laughs> can you go to your, uh, your last slide with the email and everything? It, is that a dayquid made of pickles? <laughs> <laughs> it's actually from Mario. Uh, do you know the Nazis that they have? Do they steal it like they are? <laughs> <laughs> I, know, I never looked at it any differently, but I guess it can't be unseen. 
Thanks, man. All right, that's enough. See you guys.